The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Well, Paul, the intro for part one, not our best, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think top five, easy. I think Adam did a great job. I just think that, you know, I, I still don't know how to start the show. This, of course, is The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Hi, Paul. Hi, Ben. How are you? I'm doing well. And on tonight's show, part two of Inpatient Diabetes with Dr. Dave Lieb, our returning guest. We're not really returning. This is just the rest of the conversation we had. And before we reintroduce our co-host, our guest host for this one, Paul, would you remind people, what is it that we do on The Curbsiders? Sure. Happy to, Matt. As a reminder, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Um, And we are joined once again by, and I think we established firmly as astute listeners will recall, hospitalist whiz kid, uh, Dr. Adam Brelsky. Um, (laughs) I like it. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, it rolls right off the tongue. I really think this one's going to stick, Adam. I feel good I am, about this. I am much older than you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no one's older than me. I think it's also for my established canon. But anyway, great to see you, Adam. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you guys talked about tonight? You too. So, so tonight we discussed hyperglycemic emergencies, DKA, HHS, euglycemic DKA, insulin drips, how to s- transition someone from a drip to uh, sub-Q insulin, and much more. You don't want to miss this one. And of course, we should thank Dr. Cyrus Askin, who helped co-write and produce this episode. But as I mentioned on the previous one, you know, parenting emergencies come up and uh, sometimes you have to skip a podcast. But let me tell you, our our guest, Dr. David C. Lieb, MD, FACE, FACP. He's an associate professor of internal medicine and the program director of the endocrinology fellowship program at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. And as I said, he has an interest in thyroid, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and transgender endocrine care. So check him out on Endo Twitter. We'll put his handle in the show notes. Dave, uh, thank you. This is a part two for the audience. We've, we're, we've been recording for, this is a marathon session, but for the audience, this has been maybe a week since they last heard you. But This time, we're going to talk about a little bit more of a severe case of hyperglycemia. Adam is going to get us into it. Yes. Thank you for for the introduction. So our our next case is a 27-year-old previously healthy woman named Dee, who is brought into the emergency department for confusion. Uh, She's felt unwell for the past two weeks, said that she lost about 10 pounds, feeling overwhelmingly thirsty and urinating constantly. Labs on her uh, admission show a glucose of 485, a bicarb of 14, potassium of 4.7, and an anion gap of 26. So this is a very different case than the last one we talked about. So uh, how would you approach approach this case? Uh, So she's got diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, Her glucose is high. It's greater than 250. Her bicarb is low. It's less than 18. Uh, and she's got an elevated anion gap. Um, now, whether she's got type 1 diabetes with sort of classic uh, uh, ketosis or ketosis prone type 2 diabetes, uh, I don't think you know at this point, but she needs fluids, she needs insulin, uh, she probably needs an endocrinologist, and she definitely needs an intensivist. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I would start. So getting into the disposition, it sounds like for her, she would not be admitted to the general medical floor. No, she's pretty sick. She needs to be on IV insulin. She has um, uh, she has more severe uh, ketoacidosis. You mentioned you mentioned fluids for for her. I guess like just talking about the triage of this. What do you where where's your head at? And I I mean I I know there's order sets that are a big part in taking care of patients with the more severe hyperglycemia, DKA, or HHS. But can you, what's, what's in those sets? What orders are we going to have up front for a patient like this that are most important? Yeah. So, so 
you know, uh, everything kind of starts with fluids because these folks tend to be very dehydrated. Um, they've probably been ketotic for some significant period of time. They're probably urinating a lot if they don't have end stage renal disease. So people usually need a lot of fluid, uh, you know, one to two liters in the first couple of hours, uh, you know, plus a pretty high rate after that time. Uh, you want to be careful about using normal saline because of the hyperchloremic uh, acidosis that you can see after that. That can kind of confuse the picture as to whether somebody's recovering. Um, uh, you know, with with ketoacidosis, um, the the patient either it has an absolute insulin deficiency, like you see in somebody with type one diabetes, where there's just no insulin at all, or they have a relative insulin deficiency uh, in the setting of severe insulin resistance, which is what we can see in these, these folks that come in with ketosis-prone type 2 diabetes that require a ton of insulin. Um, and, uh, and because of the insulin deficiency, you see a, a rise in glucagon, and the glucagon causes the free fatty acids to, uh, to be converted into ketone bodies. And that's what eventually leads to the acidosis. So you have to treat the dehydration, you have to give them insulin, uh, and uh, along the way, you have to manage any electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, so the classic teaching is people come in, they're a little hyperkalemic like D because they're so dehydrated, but it doesn't take very long before you recognize that they're full body depleted in potassium, and you have to start giving them potassium with their fluids. Uh, and at some point, typically when the blood sugar drops below 250, you have to start giving them some glucose as well. Uh, some dextrose in their in their fluids because otherwise there's a risk for hypoglycemia. And th there's there's protocols to do all this. And you yep. mentioned um, with DKA that the the fluid deficit is usually like one to two liters you want to give, and then you're going to keep giving more. It, it's true. Is it true with HHS? Like, are you more aggressive with the fluids if it was if this was an H, a patient with HHS and their sugar was a thousand? Yeah. You, they need more fluid. Yeah, they tend to need more fluid. I think one of the one of the um, common things that we see after we get consulted in somebody with ketoacidosis or with HHS is that they're just they're still not getting enough fluid, and we have to increase their fluids. Even if they're starting to drink a little bit, it's probably yeah. still not enough. Of course, that's in the setting of watching for you know if they've got heart failure and NC sure. mm -hmm. disease. But and you alluded to you like lact lactated ringers or something other than normal saline, so you don't start chasing that. Chloro hyperchloremic acidosis. Yes. Yeah. Got yeah. it. So you, you would use LR as opposed to normal saline in, yeah. in a patient like this? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, generally. And um, so uh, it's interesting. Uh, when I, um, when I kind of made the decision in residency that I wanted to be an endocrinologist, uh, I, I asked uh, my different attendings for some advice uh, in a very nerdy way. Uh, and, and one of my absolute favorite teachers, uh, uh, Dana Madison, who is still at OHSU, uh, he told me that no matter what the endocrine emergency was, uh, you could just give more fluid. So when they <laughs> called you and said, what do we do? This guy's got, you know, ketoacidosis. Uh, you could just say, give more fluid. Uh, if they had adrenal crisis, you could say, give more fluid. If they were hypercalcemic, uh, you can tell them that the patient needed more fluid. And so I thought that was pretty good advice. And it's usually true. You you mentioned the pathophysiology for DKA, and we've alluded to HHS a little bit. Do you mind just describing the difference between those two in terms of how you think of them? Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on how much insulin is around uh, and whether they have an absolute insulin deficient state or not. Um, uh, uh, cause oftentimes with HHS, the fluids, you're going to see a significant improvement in their glucose alone. Um, uh, uh, they may still need some insulin, uh, but I don't think it plays as much of a, of a significant role in the pathophysiology. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure if it's worth talking about the specific rates of the drips and things like that, because I think almost every institution at this point has a protocol that you're going to follow once you've decided that this is the diagnosis. Yeah. The, the, the key thing, uh, and this is something that I try to teach too, is um, uh, everything is algorithm driven when it comes to DKA and HHS. Um, but you still need to think about the patient. Um, you know, we've seen folks that, um, you know, maybe had uh, a drop in their glucose too quickly. 
Um, the rate of the drip was so much that they dropped their glucose pretty quickly. Uh, and they went from having a very low sodium to a much higher sodium. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, obviously that can cause issues with respect to, um, uh, you know, demyelinization and those sorts of things. Uh, not common in adults. Uh, that tends to be more of a concern in children, uh, but we've seen it. Uh, it happens. Uh, so, you know, in a patient that's got end-stage renal disease where maybe you can't give as much fluid, uh, you just need to be cautious about some of these things. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, if everything is algorithm-driven, uh, you kind of feel like the patient's on autopilot and you may not be paying as close attention to what's going on with them. So one of the th- ways to avoid that would be very frequent lab checks. You're paying close attention to the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, mm-hmm. make sure you factor in their, their renal function. And, and then with, with this patient, we gave you a pretty clear cut case. I tend to see the patient cause I don't work in the ICU. I tend to see the patient that maybe their pH was 7.35 and their bicarb was 20. And, uh, some will sometimes we'll just have a, we'll just have a borderline low bicarb and a sugar 275. And someone calls it, someone calls it DKA. Can you talk a little bit about the, what, how you make the diagnosis? Do you see these borderline cases? Is that just me or is that, is that pretty common? I think it's pretty common. Um, I don't see them as much. Uh, because typically those are patients that we may not get consulted on. Uh, so, uh, so sort of the patient that that has more um, more mild ketoacidosis. Again, somebody who's got a pH that's greater than seven point two or seven point two five. The the American Diabetes Association actually has um, uh, you know sort of three different categories for who's got mild, who's got moderate, and who's got more severe DKA the blood glucose is greater than 250 for mild, moderate, mm-hmm. and severe DKA. For patients with HHS, it's greater than 600. For mild DKA, the pH is 7.25 to 7.3. For moderate, it's 7 to 7.24. And for severe, it's less than 7. The bicarb is less than 18 for everybody, but it's 15 to 18 for mild, 10 to 14 for moderate, less than 10 for severe. So so Dave, if, if DK came in a little bit differently and had more mild DKA. And I think you mentioned that if the, you know, the bicarb was in the 18 range and her pH was 7.3, that would kind of make her more of a mild. Would, would that be appropriate to start a kind of a basal bolus or sub Q insulin for her? It, you know, in my practice, I've seen a lot of times this will make this decision based on how they respond to initial management triage in the emergency department. So she might get regular insulin and her blood sugar might come down and she looks clinically well. Is it appropriate to manage her with sub-Q if, if those things are the case? Yeah, I, you know, there there have been an, a, a number of studies, smaller studies, uh, you know, anywhere from 20 to 60 uh, patients with mostly mild, maybe moderate DKA that were treated with with sub Q regimens rather than IV insulin, potentially treated uh, on the general medical floor rather than in the ICU. Uh, and it looks like you know those patients, if they get uh, sub Q injections of rapid acting insulin every one or two hours until their blood sugars are less than two hundred and fifty under better control, uh, the the time to resolution of um, of their ketoacidosis may not be all that different. Uh, between the two groups. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely um, reasonable in that patient with more mild disease. Um, but, but there have not been studies in patients with more severe ketoacidosis using subcutaneous protocols, uh, and that's probably not safe. Do you think these protocols, are, are they on the order of 0.3 units per kilogram basal and then they're giving the equal equal amounts of of uh, short acting every two hours or four hours. What do those even look like? I've never I've never done it before, so I I don't even know how you you, I, you say you sub Q, but I'm not even sure what that would look like. Yeah, so the the studies that that have been published uh, talk about um, initial doses that are like 0.3 units per kilo uh, of of rapid acting insulin. Uh, mm. followed by 
0.1 units per kilo every hour until their blood sugar is less than 250. Oh, um, wow. And it's yeah. all rapid. Yeah. Or, um, you know, here's another study. I'm, I'm looking over a table, you know, 0.3 units per kilo followed by 0.2 units per kilo one hour later, uh, and then 0.2 units per kilo every two hours until the blood sugar is less than 250, wow. and then start reducing it down. Um, so, um, yeah. So, and so, they're probably checking the glucose every... 30 every minutes hour. to yeah, an hour yeah. or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and the Just main outcomes sure. that they look at are time to resolution of the DKA, mortality, uh, rates of hypoglycemia. Uh, and it looks like in a lot of these studies, there's really no difference between the two groups. Yeah. And you would still be doing the fluids, the blood draws to monitor the electrolytes. Yes. Same, same as you would otherwise in, the, in this case, because they're still at the risk for the same kind of big shifts in potassium and things. Yes. Okay. So it's, yeah. it sounds like a patient, even if we were saying this was more uh, mild or moderate, would still require a decent amount of nursing care and attention, at least in the, sh uh, you know, up front. So a lot of, yeah. a lot of the disposition may be determined by how, how rapidly they're improving within that emergency department stay is my thought. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would need to look to see sort of if there were significant differences in, in the rates of hypokalemia and that kind of thing. You know, somebody who has more mild DKA uh, maybe is going to be less likely to develop a significant hypokalemia. And so uh, the frequency that you're checking um, a potassium may be a little bit less. It may be something that you could watch on the floor. So Cyrus Askin, uh, your, your friend and our producer who unfortunately couldn't be with us for this part, he had a question about in the European DKA guidelines, he was mentioning that it sounds like maybe they're using long acting insulin up front, even, even if the person's going to go on a drip, maybe just to get the basal insulin on board mm -hmm. and maybe that spares the time on the drip. Is mm -hmm. that, do you think that's something that might come to the States or have you seen it done? Uh, for sure. Uh, and again, especially, uh, during COVID, uh, that became something that was pretty common, uh, where people would get, um, some early basal insulin, um, uh, and, and sometimes within the first 12 hours of starting the IV insulin drip. And, um, uh, this group, it may have been the group at, at, at Houston, Houston Methodist. I need to check that to be sure, but it's in this COVID and DKA paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, they, they gave people a dose of basal insulin, 0.25 units per kilo within the first 12 hours of starting IV insulin. Um, and they saw a reduction in rebound hyperglycemia uh, after DKA resolution um, that was, uh, significantly different, uh, in the, the, the group that got that dose of basal insulin. So the thought is that you can give people insulin, um, uh, basal insulin a little bit earlier, and it may help with, uh, improving their glycemic control after the DKA is resolved. Um, sometimes we'll give a dose of basal insulin, uh, to help us to kind of estimate how much insulin the patient's going to need when they come off the drip. Um, uh, so I'll do some of that. That's interesting. And I think we'll get a little bit toward, uh, the transition from the insulin drip in the future, uh, during this podcast. Um, I, I want to ask a different question though. It just, I, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't, um, have you explain what other things we should be thinking about, what other workup we should do, uh, when a patient comes in with DKA. Yeah. I, you know, I think, um, you, you don't want to miss uh, infection. Uh, you don't want to miss uh, ischemia, ischemic heart disease, ischemic peripheral vascular disease. Um, uh, you know, you need to think about different stressors that could potentially cause the patient to develop DK because usually there's some sort of stressor. Um, one of the things that I think you have to be really careful about is um, the, the, the patient that uh, comes into the hospital uh, once a month uh, with ketoacidosis, and um, you know you start to become biased towards that person. Oh, they're always here. Uh, you know, sometimes one of the learners may say, "Oh, this person is non-compliant with their insulin therapy." Um, uh, I have worked really hard, especially in the last year, to sort of strike the phrase non-compliant from, uh, from, from rounds, yeah. uh, because there's always, there's always a reason that somebody isn't taking a medicine, including insulin. Uh, and you just need to figure out what that reason is. 
Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, but, uh, but you know, that one time that somebody comes in and you're like, ah, oh, you know, it's Mr. So-and-so we never, he never takes his insulin and that's why he's in the hospital again. Uh, that's the time that you're going to miss, um, you know, a sacral wound or cellulitis or some sort of terrible dental infection. Uh, you know, so a rotting toe, oh, I've heard that, yeah. that story. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Sure. So, I mean, so you got you to gotta think about all of those things and, and always give the patient the benefit of the doubt. So to, to summarize, you want to know where those inflammatory cytokines are being generated from. That's, yes. That's yeah. and actually, uh, in this awesome paper uh, that, I, that I mentioned by my, my friend Archana, um, uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful figure, uh, and it's got a conceptual framework for the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, and there's a lightning bolt uh, shooting out <laughs> at uh, sort of the middle of the figure. And it says uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. <laughs> of course. It's beautiful. Of course. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll, make sure, we'll make sure people can, can find that uh, from the show it's, notes. It's a, it's a great article. All right. Well, I think we should get back to the next part of the case here. Uh, Adam, do you want to take us forward? So, so um, our patient D has positive urine and serum ketones. Uh, she's admitted to the ICU. She started on an insulin drip and plenty of IV fluids. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but just to kind of pull it out explicitly, what, what monitoring does she need and what are our treatment goals for her care while she's in the intensive care unit? Some folks will follow their, uh, their serum ketones uh, and look to see an improvement in serum ketones. Uh, and typically, we measure serum beta-hydroxybutyrate because the concentration of that is so much higher than other uh, ketone bodies that you can measure. Um, so that's, that's uh, one big thing. Um, certainly watching their potassium, certainly watching their, you know, their glucose um, uh, a lot of it uh, is is how the patient is clinically responding uh, to what you're doing. Um, I, I think that's probably more important than anything else. Uh, you know, how do they look? You know, are, are they starting to drink? Are they starting to eat? Um, are they saying they're hungry? Are they still laying on their side, you know, saying that their stomach really hurts? Uh, so, uh, I mean, certainly we monitor electrolytes and those things, but I, I feel like a lot of it depends on how the patient looks clinically. And, and that helps me in making decisions about when to start transitioning them off the insulin to, you know, to sub Q insulin. So for our patient here, I guess we, I guess we can talk, I, I do want to talk about euglycemic DKA. I'm not sure now's in the right time. Maybe we should talk about transitioning the, the transition. So Adam, do you want to bring us to the next part of the case. So over the next 36 hours, she's clinically improved and her blood sugar is now in uh, 180s. Her anion gap is closed. The cultures that we've sent have been negative today and there are no clear provoking causes. Talk to us a little bit about how and when we could safely transition D off of the insulin drip. And how do we, how do we actually do that in a practical sense, transitioning someone from an insulin drip to sub-Q insulin? This is, uh, this is so important. Um, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of pressure uh, to have somebody that's starting to look well uh, come out of the ICU, um, uh, you know, especially if they look pretty good compared to the other people that are in the intensive care unit. Um, but if someone still has an elevated anion gap, if they have a low bicarb, uh, if they're still nauseated, if they're still throwing up, um, you know, those people for sure, I keep on the drip. Um, I like to see people eating before we transition them off. Uh, I know that that's not always possible. Um, I like to make transitions during the day. Uh, it seems like a safer time than making a transition at night, just because there's going to be more eyes on the patient. Um, and one of the key things is, is, is overlapping that first basal insulin injection and the drip by uh, at least two hours. Um, it's also usually good to make sure that their sugars are well controlled, less than 180 before you make the transition. Um, and then once someone's on basal insulin and mealtime insulin, they're feeling better and they're drinking and eating, they can, they can move to the general ward and come out of the ICU. Um, uh, I think we often see folks that have been transitioned uh, too early 
Um, uh, many of our consults in the ICU start with us putting the patient back on the drip. That doesn't always make people very <laughs> happy. Uh, but, you know, it may be because the, the primary team um, determined a dose of insulin for them for the transition that was just wasn't enough. You know, that happens sometimes. Um, uh, or there may not have been adequate overlap. Uh, and that's why communication with the nursing staff is also really important. Um, and there are a couple of different ways to, to determine insulin dosing when somebody's coming off the drip. Um, I personally, I like to look at the last four to six hours uh, when somebody wasn't eating uh, or getting any kind of nutrition if possible. And you kind of figure out about how much insulin are they getting per hour. Uh, and then you can use that to calculate about how much they would need in 24 hours for their basal dose. Uh, and then you can give that same amount as mealtime insulin throughout the day. So you kind of you know, double it to get that total daily dose. Um, uh, I feel badly when I see a student who's calculating out like the last 12 hours on the drip or like the last 24 <laughs> hours on the drip. And I'm like, no, you don't have to do all that. It's like, look what's been going on recently. Um, Sometimes people are getting a lot of insulin on the drip, and it's much more than we would expect them to need, maybe based on how insulin resistant they seem, what their insulin doses were you know, in the past, or what they're on at home. Uh, and we'll look, and their goal insulin on the IV insulin software that we use uh, will be really tight. And the first thing that we'll do is back off on that, let their insulin requirements come down, um, and then transition them. Um, if, uh, if somebody's on pressors, uh, I tend to keep them on the drip until the pressors are off. Um, uh, sometimes when people are on pressors and they're clamped down and you're giving them subcutaneous insulin injections, they may not be as effective. There's concerns about absorption. Um, so those are some of the kind of rules of thumb that I follow. So just to summarize a little bit, uh, so generally if they're on the drip, they're well-controlled, they're bicarbs normalized the serum ketones have disappeared almost somewhat yeah yeah some people measure the ketones and follow them i don't necessarily do that uh again it's for me it's more kind of how the patient looks if the anion gap is closed and their bicarb is pretty normal and they're drinking and they're like hey i feel pretty good i'm ready to eat you know those people i'm going to feel really comfortable with transitioning and the, and the blood sugar is less than one two hundred yeah, less than 180, 180, less than 200. Yeah. So you would start a dose of uh, basal insulin that's equal to the last four to six hours, you know, averaged over 24 hours. So if they were on one unit an hour, then they get 24 units. And you would start yeah. that two, at least two hours before the drip stops. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you give them the injection of the, of the glargine that you've calculated, uh, and then you let it overlap with the drip. And then you turn the drip off. Uh, so you give it a little bit of overlap time. Some people will reduce that basal dose by, by 20%, you know, and give 80% of it. You know, again, it's sort of, that's the art, the art of medicine. Uh, but you may see, you see that in some review papers okay. too. That's good. And, and if they need to stay in the ICU because they're on pressors, then there's no reason to transition them yet. I don't, I don't rush it. Well, let's, let's resolve this case. She does well on basal bolus insulin off the drip. We talked in the last episode a bit about the transition. There's going to be a lot of education connecting her with primary care, making sure there's really tight follow-up, trying to make sure she can get her medicine. I, I think we could do a whole separate show about insulin, the cost of insulin and why it's so expensive. And there's some, uh, there's been some great stuff. I, I, I think, uh, Adam, I, I can send an article uh, that about about the pricing of insulin, why it's so expensive. I think it's from the Atlantic I read, but or maybe Bloomberg or something like that. But it was, it's pretty, it's sad, but uh, a reality. It's very sad. It is very sad. Let's, let's talk about, uh, but let's say we discharge her and let's switch this case a little bit. Maybe she was, this was an older patient, um, 45 years old, they were on an SGLT2 inhibitor and a basal insulin and metformin, and they came in with uh, what we thought was euglycemic DKA. Can you talk a little bit about the how that happens? And, and, and then I, I would just like to know, I have some follow-up questions, but let's talk first about like just what is euglycemic DKA? How does that happen? 
Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a fascinating topic. Uh, uh, there was a really nice uh, review in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine uh, in 2021. The lead author is Britt Long. Um, so most patients come into the hospital with DKA and have a blood glucose that's greater than 250. Uh, but about 5% of people will come in with ketoacidosis, but be euglycemic. Uh, it's not really euglycemic. Their blood sugar is, is usually greater than 200, uh, but it's less than, it's less than 250. Um, it's, it's lower than you would expect it to be. Um, so, so again, typically with ketoacidosis, there's either an absolute or relative insulin deficiency that stimulates glucagon production, release of free fatty acids that then serve as brain food as ketones, and then the acidosis follows. In euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, there's reduced glucose availability in addition to the insulin deficiency. So it could be because the person just hasn't been eating very much and they don't have much stores. It could be because they're pregnant uh, or somebody who is uh, you know, uh, drinking a lot of alcohol. Uh, it could be somebody that has chronic liver disease or somebody who is septic. Um, or it could be somebody who's taking a medication that increases urinary excretion of glucose, and that's what happens with patients taking SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and not only do the SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the reabsorption of glucose in the proximal tubule, but they also reduce the clearance of ketone bodies. So like double UG. Hmm. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> right. And I, I guess part of my question is, if it was a person that just they were taking the SGLT2, they stopped taking their insulin when they felt sick, and they came in with this euglycemic DKA. Do, it, does this mean they can never go back on those medications uh, as long as you, you start, give them some sick rules? Yeah, n- yeah, not necessarily. I mean, if somebody is doing really well otherwise, um, and there's a clear reason that maybe this happened, uh, and they've got other indications for being on an SGLT2, like chronic kidney disease uh, or heart failure, uh, you don't necessarily want to keep that individual from taking that medication ever again. Um, uh, so personally, uh, I think it's always worth retrying if the person's the right person, the patient's the right patient, uh, but certainly there needs to be education about it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that everybody would agree with that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of um, debate about whether to use um, SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, I've seen enough people at Cashlack that uh, came in ketoacidotic with type 1 diabetes on SGLT2 inhibitors that I'm not a real fan. Uh, but there are other people in the right patient you know, you have a conversation, you kind of figure it out and, and make sure that people are being safe and it, it, it might be reasonable to do. The, 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 the scary thing is that these folks are still dehydrated. They still need fluid. Uh, you know, they may still need potassium uh, and they still need insulin. And so if somebody comes in, their, their glucose is 220, uh, you may miss ketoacidosis completely if you're really kind of glucose centric and focused on the, the glucose. Right. So you have to, you have to know that they were taking one of these agents or you, you also gave us another couple conditions mm-hmm. or situations where it could be set up for a euglycemic DKA. I hadn't really heard of it prior to the SGLT2 inhibitors coming, uh, coming into play. So, uh, in full disclosure, bad endocrinologist, uh, I don't know that I had really heard about it before either. <laughs> uh, uh, it was first described in the seventies. So the concept has been around for a while. Uh, but clearly, uh, I think because I hadn't encountered it before, uh, it's, it wasn't, it's not that common. Uh, but, right. but the, the SGLT2 inhibitors have kind of changed that a little bit, maybe a lot. Right. It sounds like it may be, especially with type one diabetes, I imagine what happens is people are seeing better numbers. So they, they think they don't need to take their insulin or they skip their insulin and then they, they're, they're not getting that basal coverage. Maybe. So their, yeah. their body shifts into ketone, yeah. ketone mode. And, and, um, the, one of the key things about the euglycemic ketoacidosis is the patients still feel bad. So they're still vom- mm-hmm. like v- vomiting is like the number one when you, you know, I was looking at a, at a paper that kind of talked about the, uh, you know, how people present, uh, they still present vomiting. So, you know, 
clearly there's something wrong, you know, and they know it and the doctors and, and nurses and people taking care of them know there's something wrong. Uh, but it's just confusing because their, their glucose may be much more right. normal than you would expect. And the other thing that can happen is, you know, sometimes people will give themselves an injection of insulin on their way into the ER. So by the time they get to the emergency room, they're ketoacidotic, but they gave themselves insulin two hours ago and their blood sugar is not so bad. You know, they're like, what are you, why are you making such a big deal out of this? <laughs> but, you know, they did the right thing, you know, but, but, and, and actually the other thing, um, uh, uh, especially with COVID, um, you know, people have been more likely to present with di- new onset diabetes with ketoacidosis. Um, sometimes it's type one. Uh, it may be ketosis prone, uh, and we could do a whole hour about COVID and 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 diabetes and new diabetes because it's a really fascinating area. Kids with type one diabetes, uh, there seems to be an increased incidence of type one presentations during the pandemic, and they're and the kids are more sick than they used to be. They're coming in more likely to be ketoacidotic for reasons that aren't entirely clear. Um, one of the concerns is that during COVID, nobody wants to go to the emergency room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so people are kind of hanging out at home, uh, you know, waiting too long before they come in. So a- again, I think education is key uh, for people that have diabetes that are on SGLT2 inhibitors, making sure um, that that they know about this, you know, that this could happen uh, is, is if they're not feeling well and they go to the hospital, you know, tell them to go to the hospital and tell them to make sure that their doctors know that they're on this medicine. Um, I think people are, it's, it's, it's picking up. People generally kind of know about this now, you know, now that it's Mm. been a few years. Does David, does, does the management of these patients differ from patients with hyperglycemic DKA? It sounds like it's all the same principles in. Yeah. I, I, from, from, you know, I think it's generally the same. Um, You just, because you're going to be giving them insulin you may have to give them more dextrose uh, to keep yeah, them from getting Yeah, those start off with dextrose in their fluids. Right? Exactly. <laughs> that's that's yeah. It's, it's that's the key, that's probably the key difference. Well, I, I wanted to ask about, and I probably should have done this before we moved to this case. I, I forgot we had wanted to talk a little bit about continuous glucose monitors yeah. and insulin pumps. And I think with D to to revisit that case, it, it could be very. This happens not too uncommonly. You you have a young person or or just somebody who has type one diabetes and they have they're on a pump. Maybe they have a continuous glucose monitor, and they come in and uh, maybe the pump malfunctioned or something. Can you talk a little bit about what what we should do if someone who's on a pump comes in and they're coming in with? Uh, I guess let's start off first with DKA. What do you, what do you think about there? And then, um, we could talk about pumps in general, maybe patients without DKA. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, the first thing to do, uh, is to, um, uh, is to stop using the pump, uh, (laughs) you know, uh, uh, in that moment. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk about with my patients, uh, you know, because a lot of times when people come in on a pump and, and we're trying to understand why they have ketoacidosis, they'll say it's because of pump malfunction. Something happened with the pump. I wasn't absorbing the insulin. My sight was bad. Something wasn't right. So the key thing is, um, you know, if your blood sugar is 300 or 350 or 400 at home uh, and you're starting to feel achy and maybe a little bit nauseated, do not use your insulin pump to bring your blood sugar down. Uh, give yourself a freehand injection of rapid acting insulin and then deal with the pump business. Uh, so that's something that I try to try to teach my patients. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, with respect to ketoacidosis, um, you know, you just kind of have to figure out what happened. Uh, all kinds of things can happen with the, with, uh, with insulin pumps. Um, sometimes you think the site's in place and it's fallen out, uh, and you kind of didn't realize it. Uh, or it's in an area where the insulin is not getting absorbed very well. Uh, my favorite story uh, from residency, um, uh, my wife Emily and I had gotten uh, two kittens, uh, uh, Hash Brown and Rerun. Uh, they were lovely cats. Uh, sadly, they're no longer with us. I, I, I don't feel like I'm that <laughs> old, uh, but, uh, but, they, but they're gone now. Um, and uh, I think you know, one, one day I came home post-call, uh, and, you know, was totally exhausted and kind of passed out on our couch. And when I woke up, 
I still felt really bad. <laughs> I was like, oh, this isn't this isn't what it's supposed to be like. You know, oh, normally gosh. I don't feel this bad. Uh, and I looked, and um, you know, the 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 tubing of my insulin pump was just like had just been oh. chewed through. And uh, uh, they did it a couple of times, and then they stopped doing it. Uh, thank goodness, because. <laughs> But uh, they were trying. They gave up on killing you. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. They just tried a couple of times. Uh, but I, but I, I, I won. They weren't successful. They, they, they may have gotten uh, hypoglycemic and passed out. <laughs> so yeah, it's just insulin is like I can't imagine why they would keep like uh, you know if you've ever smelled insulin, uh, it's like you know it's really medicinal, alcoholy smelling, nasty. Like I don't know why. Uh, you know, why they would do that, but they did it more than once. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, so there, there are a lot of different problems that can happen with an insulin pump. Um, and, and we can talk about insulin pump use in the hospital, uh, and CGM use in the hospital sort of outside of ke- ketoacidosis. Cause it's a, it's a fascinating topic. Okay. So the, the ketoacidosis thing is fairly easy where we put them on the drip, stop using the pump. Once they're ready to, once they're ready to get back towards uh, discharge, or it, let's just say it was like our first pet patient Enzo mm-hmm. coming in the hospital, and instead of being on all those oral meds, he, he was on an insulin pump. How might we have handled that uh, with with him coming in the hospital, and who manages that, yeah. and how do we how do we do that? Um, so, uh, so, so uh, for for insulin pumps. Um, Typically, we'll have the patient sign a form, and I think a number of institutions have something like this, where they they sign something that says that they understand that using the pump in the hospital might carry certain risks, um, but that they're making a decision together with their care team to continue using it. Um, and you know, most people do fine. Um, uh, when I talk to patients, the key thing is that they will know more about that insulin pump and its management than anybody else in the hospital. Um, uh, they'll know more than I do because, because it's, it's their body and it's their insulin pump and it's what they feel comfortable with. Um, so, you know, they have to have all their supplies, you know, they have to have all their infusion sets and batteries. People are always forgetting to bring batteries to the hospital. Um, usually those are pretty easy to find on the floor, but, um, and, um, you know, they have to be awake enough and with it enough to be able to manage the pump. And sometimes people aren't if something changes with their clinical status or if they're getting certain medications that affect their ability to, to take care of themselves. Um, I don't like it when people say, Oh, well, you know, uh, my wife's going to be here with me the whole time. Uh, and she knows how to use the pump. Um, you know, <laughs> she's not going to be there all the time. She's no matter how much she loves you, she's going to get up and leave at some point. And, you know, and so your care, like who's taking care of you at that point. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of education for nursing staff on the floor, um, uh, uh, but insulin pump stuff is sometimes, uh, you know, detailed enough. There's different insulin pumps, uh, that it's not always easy to give enough, um, education. Um, actually one of our, one of our residents, um, Zara, uh, Tasneem at, at EVMS, uh, is putting together a QI project, uh, with one of our fellows, Toby Nelson, to help educate our residents about insulin pumps and some of the basics, you know, what basal rates are, what carb ratios are, what correction factors are, what a temporary basal rate is, all the things that, that, that they are going to potentially need to intervene on in the hospital, or at least know to think about so that they can ask the diabetes educators to come by and make some of those changes. Um, so if you were admitting someone, if, if we were admitting this guy, Enzo, with pneumonia, and sugar was, I think we gave a sugar of 215 to, to start off. This was the guy from our, our first part would you, you would, the, and he says, Oh, I I'm, I've had this thing for 10 years. I feel comfortable managing it. Then we can, we can let him manage it. We would still get the, if he's not on a continuous monitor, we would, we would do the finger sticks mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he would know what to do to adjust it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then we would consult. I usually I would consult the endocrine service just to make sure that they're following along. Yeah. But overnight, it might be okay for him to him to self manage. I think so. I think so. Depending on the patient. And, and again, yeah. it always, you know, and kind of what their clinical status is, but often it's fine. And usually we like to be uh, consulted. The endocrine team likes to be consulted and our diabetes educators are really wonderful with pumps too. And so they can also be helpful. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, if something comes up in the middle of the night and, and there's any concern, uh, you can always give somebody an injection of basal insulin, uh, and then put them back on their pump 24 hours later. You know, uh, there's, there's no rush. Um, the, the key thing I think to know about people that are using, uh, insulin pumps is that, uh, uh, people often feel very attached to their pumps, uh, pun 100% intended, uh, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, that was really bad. I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a level of control that you have over what's happening to you. Um, you know, if you're in the hospital, uh, and you're upset because normally you take your insulin 20 minutes before you eat, if you have a pump, you can take your insulin 20 minutes before you eat. You have some control over that. Mm -hmm. If, uh, if you're on fixed doses of insulin and, uh, the person that put in the orders was really anxious and calculates four units of insulin for a meal, and you know that your blood sugar is going to be 300 and you really need eight units. Um, if you're on fixed insulin you know, you ask the nurse, the nurse is busy, uh, the nurse will maybe call the doctor, the doctor or the nurse practitioner, whoever put in the order, maybe they're not getting back, maybe it's at night, maybe it's dinner, it's a different team, you know, so like, it can be very, very frustrating for people with diabetes to be in the hospital. Uh, and when people have an insulin pump, uh, they have some control over what's going on. Uh, and so you have to be careful about taking the pump away. And, and appreciate that, you know, that there's consequences, uh, sometimes, you know, emotionally for the patient. Uh, so you have to have a discussion with them just like about anything else. Adam, do you normally, what, how do you normally handle that when someone comes in with a pump? We, we typically, does this come up often? Yeah, it, it's, it's come up more and more. We, we typically consult the endocrinology team to help manage, but I think Dave, you've perfectly described the experience of hospitalized patients, uh, losing autonomy, losing privacy. And, yeah. um, and I, I think this is very representative of that. One of the other things that we've, I've seen a lot more recently is the, um, the continuous glucose monitors as well. And I'm curious, I'm curious how, you know, this, this comes up a lot where, you know, I, and you mentioned that one of your residents is doing a QI project. And I think this area is just ripe for quality improvement because there's, oh, there's yeah. so, there's so much to learn, so much improvement in the way our systems yeah. um, serve our patients. But I'm, I'm curious, a lot of times the nursing staff is uncomfortable, the residents, the, uh, you know, our hospitalist team or other attendings are uncomfortable in terms of how to manage the glucose monitors, whether we need to continue to do finger sticks or not. And um, what do you, what do you recommend? Uh, so I, I, I love this uh, topic. Um, uh, I think that 10 years, 20 years from now, we're going to look back on diabetes management in the hospital, uh, especially for people on drips uh, that are getting their blood sugar checked every hour and just be shocked at how barbaric uh, management yeah. has been. <laughs> um, uh, continuous glucose monitoring has changed the landscape of diabetes care. Um, uh, you know, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 12 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, I was supposed to be checking my blood sugar between four and six times a day up until I got my first continuous glucose monitor. You know, now it's been a number of years ago, uh, but just the thousands upon thousands of blood sugar checks that I had done. Uh, and once you're using a continuous monitor, um, that stops. Um, you know, there are some monitors that require calibration where you may have to check your glucose twice a day. Certainly, you can calibrate the monitors anytime. If you're not feeling well, you're supposed to check your blood sugar. If you're hypoglycemic, you're supposed to check your blood sugar. They're not always perfect at extreme highs and lows. So it's important to still do some finger sticks. Uh, but ask your patients that use continuous glucose monitors how often they really check their blood sugar. Uh, it's pretty few and far between for a lot of them. Um, and so what happens when they come into the hospital? 
Um, some people are used to having a CGM and they want to continue using it when they're, when they're inpatient. Um, uh, uh, you could make an argument that it's, that it's um, uh, uh, reasonable to consider starting CGM for people that have never used it when they're in the hospital. Um, you know, those are some of the things that, that are going to be addressed in some of the upcoming guidelines that we'll see this year. Um, uh, uh, Matt, I think you had mentioned uh, during our last uh, discussion that the ADA standards of care uh, I don't, the ADA uh, updates their standards of care every year. I don't know how they do it. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, ACE, uh, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, uh, has uh, a diabetes guideline and a diabetes algorithm that are coming out this fall. Uh, I'm the Education Oversight uh, Committee Chair for ACE, so I've been really involved in their clinical practice guidelines. Um, the Endocrine Society has um, uh, two guidelines coming out uh, this year. One is on inpatient hyperglycemia. Uh, and the other is on um, hypoglycemia in people with diabetes, and I'm a co-chair for that guideline. So, I mean, this, this, the CGM is going to be all over all these guidelines. <laughs> it's going to be all over everything because more and more people are using these. Um, uh, uh, and so inpatient use of CGM uh, is a very exciting area, lots of active research. Um, uh, the, the COVID pandemic uh, led to a lot of exciting innovation uh, because the FDA kind of allowed uh, companies to to uh, you know let folks use CGM in patient even though it wasn't fully approved uh, because again the thought was it would help with reducing the number of times that patients had to to get their fingers stuck and the number of times that nurses had to go into the rooms. Um, uh, there's still some questions about their accuracy and their safety, and so I think that. Um, we're going to probably see more continuous glucose monitor use in the hospital, but it's going to be along with finger sticks when decisions have to be made about insulin dosing. Um, uh, some of the studies that have been done suggest that CGMs can pick up hypoglycemia uh, that would otherwise be missed uh, in, in inpatient uh, you know, populations. Um, and the other thing that the CGMs can do that's really important is, you know, they have alarms. So if somebody is dropping, an alarm is going to go off and you'll catch a low blood sugar uh, before it happens, you know, when it's mm -hmm. on its way down. Uh, and there's some studies that have looked at those sorts of things, too. Uh, so I get pretty excited about CGM uh, because I think it's just a matter of time uh, before it's much, much more commonplace. Um, it and I think I was reading too that some of them can just transmit wirelessly as well. Mm -hmm. you, you, so theoretically, in the future, you'll probably have everyone will have a CGM on and it'll transmit to a central location, and people won't even have to walk around and collect collect the glucose. Isn't or, that you know the finger sticks? Is, right? Isn't that a beautiful image? <laughs> I, <laughs> that's like yeah, I, it I mean, seems totally like, attainable right now, right? Yeah. In this world, it seems totally attainable. Yeah. So I, I think. Um, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead uh, just, Adam. just for for now, the, you know, the way the hospital system, the hospitals run is that the nurses will go. They'll actually get a finger stick. They'll document it in the medical records. They'll compare that to the, you know, the correctional insulin or what what the insulin needs are, and then give a dose of insulin based on that number. If a patient has a CGM and they have a number, and you know their insulin regimen's been fairly stable for a couple of days. Do, do we still do the finger stick? Uh, I think technically, yes. I, I think that's probably what's going to be recommended by most people. Um, uh, there's still some concerns, I think, uh, again, about, um, about accuracy, especially at extreme highs and lows. Uh, I know that's not what you just said. You were saying somebody's kind of doing okay. Um, uh, in, in, in certain settings and in, in folks with, uh, uh, end stage renal disease or in patients that are critically ill, it's not clear how accurate they are. So I think we need more data to feel comfortable, but, you know, for patients that are at high risk for hypoglycemia, the patients with a history of severe hypoglycemia, the patients with, um, uh, with, you know, chronic liver disease or end stage renal disease, um, uh, we may see more CGMs in those individuals, but, but I think, uh, generally speaking, the recommendation is still going to be to do a finger stick to make some of those decisions and to use the CGM to guide some of the in between kind of what's going on. Uh, it'll certainly help, um, the, the physicians and the, and the nurses and teams that are taking care of the patients with dosing insulin, because you'll be able to kind of see what's going on in between. Um, 
Uh, but, you know, these systems are expensive. They, they require a lot of education. Um, I, I think that all these things are going to get worked out uh, and we're going to have a glorious future where people are not having their blood sugar checked very often in the hospital, but we're not there yet. Not, not quite prime time. No. I, I definitely have had patients. I had one patient recently who was on and off steroids, MPO, not MPO, and she had a CGM and it was... We, we had a lot of trouble just adjusting her, her insulin regimen in the hospital. And there were times when we would be concerned about her blood sugar being too low if she became a little bit altered. But she was fantastic. And her CGM, she would just pull it up and she'd show us the number and it would be 150. And I'd say, wonderful, we don't need to go, go there anymore because uh, she had that data readily available and it really helped some of the, those yeah. in-between times. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, now we have sensor augmented insulin pumps. So people are coming in with insulin pumps that make decisions about insulin delivery based on the sensor they're wearing. So what, what do we do with those? You know, uh, we're not asking people to remove them at our institution. We're letting people use them. Uh, but that pump is making decisions about their insulin delivery based on their sensor data. So again, it, it really depends on the, on the patient and how sick they are and how concerned you might be with respect to accuracy of the CGM and, and all of those things. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, tell our, I tell our fellows, uh, and I don't know if they believe me, but, I mean, this is like a golden age for diabetes care. Um, when, when I was a fellow, uh, all the news was really bad. Um, uh, everybody was excited about the thiazolidine diones, right? Uh, you know, like they were going to be the future. They lowered cholesterol. They were going to reduce heart attacks. Uh, and then everything with rosiglitazone came out after Steve Nissen's, uh, meta-analysis in, I think, 2008 and just shut it all down. Um, and, uh, but if that didn't happen, then we never would have figured out that the newer drugs are better for cardiovascular. That's the silver lining, Matt. That's the silver lining to the story. <laughs> um, and that's where I come full circle when I talk about this. Um, uh, and, I'm sorry to steal No, your, no, no, that's okay. To... <laughs> um, and, and the other thing was, uh, was a cord, uh, an advance uh, and the right. VA diabetes trial came out and they were like, well, if you really push it to try to get good control, people are just going to die. So we're not going to try really tight control. Yeah. So everything was very like pull back, uh, and, and not terribly exciting. But now, you know, now we have drugs that are associated with weight loss that, that benefit patients with heart failure and chronic kidney disease, you know, cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, and we have all this great technology. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and, and in the past tech was like for people with type one diabetes, you know, I kind of saw it that way. Uh, but you know, insulin pumps and sensors are for people with type two also, and now for people in the hospital. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. I know there's probably a lot more we could talk about, but it's been, we've been going almost two and a half hours in our recording time. This is going to be split into, into two different episodes for the audience. Let's for this second part here, we talked about DKA, HHS, we talked about insulin drips, euglycemic DKA, and then we ended up talking about this new technology, the pumps and the CGMs. Can you give the audience like two or three things that you, you really want them to remember from this second part of the talk? And and then what we gotta let you to go uh, back to your job as a super endo. <laughs> yeah, be be careful about transitioning folks off of their insulin drips too soon. Um, uh, remember that uh, that the technology that people may use, their insulin pumps, their continuous monitors, uh, mean a lot to them, and give them a fair amount of uh, c control that they otherwise lose in the hospital. And, and so, even if if you have to stop those things, just at least you know come at it from a compassionate uh, angle. Uh, and I think just like with our previous discussion, you know, everything really needs to be patient centered. Uh, you know, one size certainly does not fit all in medicine anymore. Um, uh, you know, we need to think about those things when we're taking care of our patients in the hospital with diabetes. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy.
There you go. Your time to shine. <laughs> get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. Yeah, Paul, I was going to let it go. If he did say yummy, there would have been no yummy. And <laughs> I was going to wait until somebody said something. I, I right. had all the patients in the world. I feel, I think it's like that butted and lost. Like if someone forgets to push it, something bad <laughs> might happen. <laughs> anyway, so we're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at the curbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And I wanted to give a special thanks to our producers and writers for this episode, Drs. Adam Borelski and Cyrus Askin, and to our whole team. Beth Garbatelli is our executive producer with production and editing support from the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Tima Karganov maintains our website. And Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I'm Adam Borelski. Hospital Swiss Kid. And as always, <laughs> our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>